And then that sort of got read back into biblical interpretation. We're going to get back to it, but I, I have to say, you keep saying this as though you can interpret the Bible, when obviously that that can't be right. It's, uh, <laughs> it's the perfect word of God, you just devoid of all interpretation. Am I wrong? <laughs> I thought that's how it's supposed to work here. Some people think so. Some people, <laughs> some people absolutely hold to that, and it's uh, that's often one of the biggest difficulties you encounter in trying to talk to people about the Bible. Hey everybody, I'm Dan McClellan. And I'm Dan Beecher. And this is the Data Over Dogma podcast. Welcome to today's episode. We've got a great one for you today. Indeed, uh, we have a guest on. Uh, this is Here's an interesting thing, Dan. Uh, I discovered you when I, just on TikTok, when we all sort of uh, during the pandemic, dove into our phones as our as the last place that we could find any kind of sanity <laughs> in the universe, and uh, you know, I found your content very interesting. And there was one other guy whose biblical content I found fascinating and honest and interesting and uh, and engaging. And that is our guest today, Aaron Higashi. Aaron, welcome. Hello. Thanks Hi. for coming on the show. I thought you were going to say somebody else after all that. <laughs> and it's not this guy, but this guy is almost as good as that we other guy. We couldn't get him. Okay? <laughs> this guy is a, like at, at most fourth down on the list. Is, that's, yeah. I'm, that's a great place to be in. Hi, I'm very happy to be on the show. Well, welcome. Um, Aaron, you're uh, you are, like Dan, a public-facing scholar. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can you tell us a little bit about your sort of bio biological? <laughs> you could tell us about that, but your biographical history. Tell us a little bit about uh, where you're coming from, how you know so much about the Bible, all of that sort of stuff. Oh man, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I uh, I did most of my growing up in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, I took a first. No Christians there. No, not a single <laughs> one actually. A avoided wasteland of Christianity. <laughs> uh, actually, I grew up like a stone's throw away from New Life Church. All these mega churches in, in Colorado Springs, non-denominational, which is like evangelical but without any accountability to an institution or something like that. <laughs> um, so that's the environment that I, I grew up in, and originally attended church in in high school and stuff. I did my first uh, take at college at Colorado State University in Fort Collins. I wanted to be a writer, uh, uh, either journalism or creative writing. I failed out for lack of maturity <laughs> and uh, moved back in with my parents. And uh, Can I just, I'm just going to butt in and say that it, there's something very uh, appealing to me about the fact that I'm the only person on this podcast who's never failed out of a college. <laughs> out of a college. Well, it's a great experience. You should try it. I'm oh, amazed. I you're also the only person who's not failed out of a college in Northern Colorado. <laughs> so that's right. That's my true. university, <laughs> I, I went to University of Northern Colorado in Greeley, which is about yeah. 30 minutes away from CSU over yeah. in Fort Collins. I used to go to parties in Fort Collins at CSU. <laughs> they're, the, so. they're the best parties or, or the worst, depending, <laughs> <laughs> depending on what you're looking for. Less cows, more more alcohol, I think. Yeah. Than, than it, doesn't, it doesn't smell as bad in Not Fort Collins. <laughs> differently bad. <laughs> differently bad. <laughs> Uh, so after I failed out of there, I moved in with my parents and started going to community college. And I, I, I happened across a, a philosophy class I took at a community college. And I just, I fell in love with philosophy. Also, it was the only thing that I was any good at because a lot of it's just arguing uh, and writing, which I, I love to do. Um, so I changed my major to philosophy. I went to the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, which has a, a beautiful campus seated in the mountains there in central Colorado Springs. Um, and uh, I took a minor in religious studies uh, and took the only religion classes they had on offer, which was like an introduction to New Testament and introduction to Old Testament. And that's where I encountered academic biblical studies for the first time. I read my first Bart Ehrman book, um, which I, I, st I still own to this day, is still marked up in all my notes. Um, and I just it just blew my mind that you could think about this stuff from an academic perspective. You know, I had grown up in this environment, sort of in and out of different churches, pretty unsatisfied with that experience. And it just opened like every door in my mind to, to you could do this, you could spend your life studying this in a different sort of way. Um, and so I graduated from there and I was either going to go to an applied ethics program at Oregon State, 
where I was going to go to a biblical studies program at Providence College in Rhode Island. And those two things probably seem very different from each other, <laughs> uh, but the underlying goal was the same. I wanted to figure out how people were interpreting the Bible and then applying it, especially in like a social and political context. Because this is back in, I'm, I'm old, so maybe not as old as, 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 as everybody else, but older than most of my TikTok followers probably. <laughs> right. um, so this is back in like, I, I mean, I, I went to college in 2004, started with a graduate in 2008, so a while ago. Uh, but this is in the middle of the Bush administration. We have a lot of Bible-believing folks using lots of Bible as a justification for this or that political policy or this or that war on terror or this or that you know, uh, funding proposal and stuff. And I wanted to know what that process was like. How do we get politics and ethics out of the Bible? Um, so I was either going to attack that from either end, ethics or biblical studies. My then girlfriend, now wife, got into her dream program at Brown doing public health. So we went up to Providence College. Nice. Um, I got a master's in biblical studies. And then because you can't do anything with a master's in biblical studies, I applied to PhD programs and didn't get into like any. Uh, but I did I did get an offer uh, to do a second master's at Chicago Theological Seminary with sort of the the implication that, you know, if you take a second master's here, then maybe we will let you into our PhD program the following year. So I did a one year master's there. Um, and then so got I'm gonna the, I'm gonna interrupt real quick and yeah. say, Dan, you're also the only one here who has not had to do a second master's because they couldn't get into a PhD program. <laughs> it's, See, so it's a rite uh, of passage, though. <laughs> evidently, it's amazing. You guys, you guys are basically the same person. <laughs> well, Dan, I'm kicking nice. you off. Aaron, you're in. I'm, <laughs> I'm tagging him. I'm tagging him out. <laughs> And That's for the, me, it was, uh, I had been accepted to go to Claremont's PhD right after my bachelor's, oh, nice. but I also got accepted to this master's program at Oxford. And I was like, oh, no offense, nice. Claremont, but you're not making, <laughs> you're not making it worth my, my, uh, my while here. So I'm going to go to Oxford. I'm going to defer because it was a one year master's program. I was mm -hmm. like, I will defer for a year. If I don't get into a better program, I've still got Claremont. That's and then a, I, Claremont's I, a nice backup to have. <laughs> it, well, it was for a minute. But I didn't get into a better program. And then I was like, okay, well, I still got Claremont. And then they emailed me and they were like, turns out we're going to take this year and just retool the whole program. So we're not accepting <laughs> oh, students. So find something else to do. And <laughs> yeah, so then I- Occupy your time. Basically. And so I, uh, I had been accepted the previous year to Trinity Western University's master's degree in biblical studies. Okay. So like hurriedly emailed them and I was like, it's your- uh, is your application window still open? And it was. And uh, so I was able to get into that most master's program. So I know exactly where you're coming from. So that, Basically, that's, the that's two nice. of you are just bumbling your way through degrees. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm how hearing. it works, man. That's, that's how you end up piling them up. <laughs> Otherwise, it would have been a straight shot right through, yeah, right? Yeah. Such, such is not the case. Um, I, I really like Chicago Theological Seminary's program. It was the only program, I remember Googling around trying to find one. And it was the only program that had hermeneutics in the title. And that was really what I was interested in, the, the interpretive process. Um, I'm glad little, you brought that up because I don't know what that word means. So if you'll just help me out with that. It's, it's really just an obnoxiously fancy word for interpretation. Um, but it also sort of came to be used to describe a field of philosophy in the continental tradition uh, in particular that focuses on how we interpret texts in general. Uh, and then that sort of got read back into biblical interpretation and became a, a word that interpreters broadly use to talk about biblical interpretation in particular. You know, we're going to get back to it, but I, I have to say, you keep saying this as though you can interpret the Bible, when obviously that that can't be right. It's, uh, <laughs> it's the perfect word of God, you just devoid of all interpretation. Am I wrong? <laughs> I thought that's how it's supposed to work here. Some people think so. Some people, <laughs> some people absolutely hold to that. And it's, uh, that's often one of the biggest difficulties you encounter in trying to talk to people about the Bible. Um, Indeed. So I, I really wanted a program that focused on that, and uh, Chicago Theological Seminary had a program called Bible, Culture, and Hermeneutics, uh, and that's what I signed up for and got into and, and really fell in love with, and that's what my PhD is in today. So that's, that's how I know at least a couple things about the Bible. <laughs> um, I specialize in Hebrew Bible. You got to pick something, and only really like nerds and saints do New Testament, so I wanted to do the fun <laughs> stuff. And, in Hebrew Bible. Yeah, nothing nerdy at all about Hebrew Bible. There's <laughs> no, nothing... It's much cooler. It's much cooler. <laughs> it, it's... Let me ask you this. Uh, in terms of, you, you mentioned earlier that uh, 
you know, when you first started, when you first realized that this was a, a study, an academic study, you, you compared the academic perspective to what you had been raised with. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about the difference between uh, sort of a lay person, a, a lay believer's study of the Bible and what you experienced in academia? Yeah, lay people tend, through no fault of their own, tend to read the Bible as a as a repository of dogma in sort of crystallized in, in, in like a more pure form. And their job is just to go to the text and then to derive, sort of re-derive over and over again, um, dogmatic beliefs that they're already committed to. So they believe that God is good. So they find passages in the Bible that seem to correspond to the idea that God is good. They think that, you know, Jesus raises, has risen from the dead. So they find passages in the Bible, Jesus rises from the dead. And so the, the Bible is just a resource to sort of affirm things that they've already come to believe as a result of tradition and church practice. Um, and that's not inherently bad, but there's a lot more ways that you can interpret the Bible. And so academics just bring a lot more tools to the table to be able to engage with the Bible. So there's historical tools to be able to set the text in its original context. There are linguistic tools to be able to get a better grasp of the original languages. There's literary tools to be able to parse apart the different sections of the text and to speculate about its origins and its different kinds of theories of composition. Um, there are more fancy philosophical and ideological tools to be able to analyze the rhetoric of, of different authors and uh, expectations of different audiences. Um, so it's just it's, it's an, an entire bag of lenses or tools to bring to the text that allow you to ask more sophisticated questions. You know, what is this author's, who is the author? Uh, at what point in history might they be situated? To whom are they speaking? What are their immediate spiritual, ideological, communal needs? How does this text help serve those spiritual, ideological, communal needs? Uh, and then asking those sorts of questions in a variety of different ways um, over time. And that's a lot of what biblical scholarship is, is trying to probe the text with these tools. And it, and it felt very empowering to me because before you're not really doing anything, right? The work has already been done. The dogma has already been laid out. It's a very circular and sort of insular process. You go to the book for the dogma that you already had to begin with and vice and over and over again. But now you can discover things or at least put forward new hypotheses about why the stuff in the text is working in the way it is using these tools. And, and it, it puts you in charge of the process of biblical interpretation. And so for people, I think in particular, who felt like they had been hurt by the Bible in some way or by Christian faith or dogma in some way, the ability to go back and undo some of that with these tools and to think differently about the text is an enormous relief um, and, and I think can be very healing as well. I think that's fascinating. I One of the things that I... Uh that I wonder about, I, I love that you're coming at it from that angle, from the angle of uh, this being a healing process or this being a, an empowering process. I, I do wonder, however, you know, one of the things that our show has done for me and that, that both of your content on TikTok, you and Dan, uh, your content on TikTok has done is to expose me to viewpoints uh, about the Bible that are true, but were I a believer, would be very challenging to a lot of those dogmas that you were that you were talking about before. Mm -hmm. Did you encounter challenge in your in your academic career that 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 either either uh, made things made your beliefs uh, I don't know difficult or 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 that 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 rocked you in some sort of way that you weren't prepared for. It's 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 been like a slow. It's a gradual process over time, but uh, yeah, it's 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 a. I mean, what what I sort of end up doing is, you you go to the biblical text without you know from a different perspective rather than a dogmatic perspective, and you encounter their morally problematic stories. You encounter there a God that defies many of your expectations about what you think God is supposed to be like. And then you have to do something with that, and and that process can be challenging on a number of a personal, prof professional, psychological. It can be challenging on a number of levels. 
I think for me, it was still exciting, though, because I got to be the one who decided how to reconcile those things. It wasn't somebody telling me, you know, maybe God seems evil here, but it's really, you know, it, it's, it actually all works out for the good, or it's actually justified that these babies are dying, or that these people are being enslaved, or this genocide is being done, or something like that. Um, I got to be the one who decides, maybe this just isn't God. Maybe this is just rhetoric. Maybe this is just ideology. Maybe this is just uh, something that felt right for them there at that time or was rhetorically useful for them there at the time, but no longer has any use for me. Maybe it did genuinely facilitate some personal you know, religious conviction at the time, but now it doesn't. And so it's, it's, um, <clears throat> you sort of feel like a, a monkey swinging through trees. You're letting grow of one branch as you are grasping onto another. But now at least you get to be the one who decides which branches you are grasping onto and which you're letting go of. And I think that's a big part of of, uh, a lot of the public discourse about how we approach the Bible is who gets to decide. It seems like a lot of the reasons that the Bible is not very dynamic, that we already know everything it, that it is allowed to say, everything that it says is because it's being used primarily to structure values and power. It's serving the interests of people largely in positions of power, whether it is on a national level, a state level, a, mm-hmm. a congregational level, even in a, within a family, um, they the Bible can be used to, to structure powers and value and to say, well, I'm going to look at it this way. And suddenly that power structure just collapses is a threat to, um, to a lot of that, uh, that tradition that has spent mm-hmm. so long constructing this approach to the Bible, this hermeneutic uh, to protect itself. And I, I appreciate a video that you uh, published a little bit ago where you addressed some of the different theologies that people bring to the text and how a lot of these different theologies, One, the one that I'm most familiar with is probably liberation theology, is an approach to the Bible that developed uh, a bit ago particularly outside of the United States, as mm-hmm. a way to kind of arrogate some power to um, to the readers and and reread the text in a way that served the interest of the underdog, uh, which historically has not been the person, the group in charge of, of interpretation. And uh, you said that uh, all these other approaches to theology, womanist theology, feminist theology, black theology, queer theology, they all get qualified. They have these uh, adjectives that are attached to them. And then you say, we presume that white male theology is is the default. And mm-hmm. one of your points there was that all theology is contextual. It's not like we have decontextualized theology and then all these other junior theologies that exactly. are yeah. developing. Do you think you could uh, talk a bit about how important it is? Uh, well, basically, what's the what you're saying there and then how important that is to you that, that people understand that there is no objective. Nobody can stand outside of all these power structures and all of these lenses and say, well, no, I'm doing it purely objectively. Mm-hmm. And also in the process, if you wouldn't mind defining <laughs> some of these different theologies, that would be awesome. Too. Sure. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that is a bit, there are so many different kinds of theology and so many different ways to, to, to parse out the different kinds of theology. So most people are familiar with just theology, at least in principle, and theology is just God talk. Or in academics, it's usually the study of the nature of God. Um, but that's still very, very broad. Uh, and can be broken down in a number of ways. Some people might be familiar with systematic theology, which is an attempt to be very comprehensive and internally consistent, saying as many things as we can possibly say about the nature of God and our relationship to God, um, using as much data as as possible. So that's systematic theology. But alternatively to systematic theology is contextual theology. And contextual theology does not aspire to be either comprehensive or uh, coherent with other kinds of contextual theology. It just attempts to speak to the theological imagination of individual communities, often with their experience, their historical experience, as sort of the catalyst for doing that theology. 
So black theology is going to reflect the community and experience and spiritual needs of black communities. And feminist theology is going to reflect the unique experience and spiritual needs of women, et cetera, et cetera, through these different kinds of contextual theology. So there's no aspiration there that they're going to say everything that can or ought to be said about God. And there's no aspiration there that whatever they have to say is going to match with what other kinds of contextual. So black theologians aren't concerned that what they're saying is going to match up with feminist theology. And feminist theologians aren't concerned that what they're going to say is going to match up with Asian American you know, theologians or something like that. So that's a big division between systematic theology and contextual theology that you can make. If you pick up a textbook on contextual theology, um, the categories are often given as you know, Black, Asian, Asian American, Native American. They're, they are related to ethnic groups and then to gender and, and, and issues of gender and sexuality. So sometimes you'll see gay and lesbian theology or queer theology, feminist theology. Uh, and then some that are combinations of these things, like womanist theology, which is both uh, black and feminist uh, for black women's experience in particular. Um, but what you will never find in uh, in those categories of contextual theology is white theology or male theology. Um, and and part of that is I think that's what Twitter is, isn't it? <laughs> that, that's what a lot of things are. Um, so yeah, I think that's what church is, yeah. isn't it? For most people in in the United in the United States, in a context where a lot of theology is white evangelical theology, yeah, that is, and so that's part of the way that you can claim the center of discourse is by not disclosing the context in which you are doing theology. So it is an attempt to depersonalize or decontextualize. You're saying my theology is not coming from my experience. It's not particular to me or the needs of my community. I am just doing theology, right? Everybody else is particular. Everybody else is dependent on the real kind that I'm doing. Um, and it is that that failure of disclosure that I was trying to call out in that video Um there's nothing wrong with being a white male theologian or doing theology from that perspective. It would be nice if such theologians disclosed, this is the perspective that I am doing it from. These are the kinds of personal experience that I am drawing upon. These are the communities that I am trying to serve and whose rhetorical and ideological interests I have most in mind. That's all you have to do. You don't have to be like, uh, every time you speak, I am a white male speaking and doing theology. Just somewhere in your project at some point, this is where I'm coming from. Um, and that's all that really that black theology and feminist theology and all these other kinds of contextual theology are doing. They're just saying, this is who I am and this is where I'm coming from and this is the community that I'm speaking to. And it's, it seems to me a lot of the folks, a lot of the white male um, folks who are engaged in theology, obviously I'm, I'm one of them as well, to the degree that I engage in theology, which I don't really call myself a, a theologian, but... Um, a lot of it is that in our training, we've never been told that we're engaging it through these lenses and we're aimed at serving these communities and, and these goals because we've always been kind of the dominant identity within the field. And so we just kind of plod along as if uh, the whole world is, is, our, um, <clears throat> is our playground. And we see others saying, "Well, I'm doing this from this perspective, uh, and I am, you know, engaging my community in doing that." And we think, "Oh, well, you're limiting yourself." We, on the other hand, are are addressing this uh, more broadly because it's usually we don't get training where we are shown that we are trying to serve certain structures of power or certain communities. And uh, and that's I think that's a big shortcoming, uh, but to do so is then to is uh, to acknowledge our positionality and to some degree limit the applicability and limit our ability to structure power over and against others who may be operating in a in a different field. So mm -hmm. un unfortunately, you know we need to that needs to be called out a lot more frequently or the field is just going to continue to train its new scholars to do the exact same thing. Yeah, there's a, there's a great book by uh, Angela Parker, um, who also graduated from um, a Chicago Theological Seminary called If God Still Breathes, Why Can't I? And, it is, um, and it's about how so many theological schools and schools of religious study 
effectively train their students, regardless of their race or gender, how to do white male theology. So you even people who come from even people of color who come from other backgrounds are still trained to perpetuate and to speak as like they are doing white male theology. Um, so yeah, it's it's very infrequently that people get access to these kinds of resources or get taught to think or speak differently about their um, the kind of work that they're doing. Is there a a sense that uh, you know I, I I read you know in in sort of greater feminism or in 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 in, in other circles t- people talk about intersectionality and and the need for uh, for that when you spoke about black theology not necessarily concerning itself with what's going on in feminist or womanist theology that sort of thing mm-hmm. uh where where does the the where does intersectionality come into it yeah well that's 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 a a, a fun way to ask that question um womanist theology emerges out of black theology specifically because of black theology's lack of attentiveness to intersectional issues so interesting it, yeah intersectionality is um, a way of thinking about various elements of social identity, gender, race, class, as though they mutually construct each other. So you can't look at gender alone, but gender, the way we think about gender is affected by class. You can't just think about race alone, the way we think about race is affected by class. And so people sort of lie at the intersections of their different elements of social identity. Um, And it was really a number of Black women's dissatisfaction with what was happening in Black liberation theology that led them to then create womanist theology, which is uh, a much more straightforward attempt to be intersectional, bringing together gender, race, and class in the doing of uh, their theological work. So when uh, a straight light, someone who is afflicted with uh, straight whiteness uh, and maleness, the way Dan is, for example, <laughs> or or myself, uh, and they're and and they're out there uh, trying to study theology. Mm-hmm. How do you recommend they that person approach it when, as you say, the sort of the structures, even in current academia, are still pretty geared toward that straight white male perspective. Yeah, fortunately today, I mean, and we've only been able to say this recently, but fortunately today we do have a fair number of women and people of color and people from the third world who are actively involved in the academy. Now they're still minority voices, but they are present. Uh, and so you can you can go to them directly and purchase their books and read their material. Um, and I, and I, I don't think it takes much. It's it's more the the willingness to, to do a little bit of that reading uh, that's the difficult part. But then once you get over that, and you can engage with some of this material, I think you'll very quickly be able to do the adjustments, or at least the bulk of the, I mean, it'll probably take the rest of your life to do all the adjustments. Uh, it's an ongoing, it's a you know an existential process uh, as it is for so many other things, but the bulk of the adjustments that need to be made uh, in, in a pretty short span of time, you can pick up a couple books, learn from a couple black theologians, feminist theologians, queer theologians um, in, a, in a relatively short span of time, and I think greatly benefit for that. A book I frequently recommend is called Liberation Theologies in the United States, uh, edited by uh, Stacey Floyd Thomas and Anthony Pinn. And it has, you know, 20 page chapter length introductions to most of the kinds of contextual theology at play today. You make it through that one book, right? Just a couple hundred pages. And that's already, you know, you are multiplying your knowledge of the diversity of theology a hundredfold in, in a pretty short span of time. I wonder if you could give us uh, some examples of, uh, you know, different different contextual theologies and how how they differ from each other. Just it's something that you know we've been talking in the abstract about this thing, and I wonder if we could, uh, you know, concretize it in in some way. Sure. So you can think about. I mean, a, a big part of uh, Black theology, for example, is th- trying to think through again, um, some elements of Christology that white folks sort of just took for granted, but are actually quite problematic for a Black community and for Black experience. Uh, so thinking of Jesus as a, uh, a entirely passive servant figure for people who have in their historical background slavery and, and household servitude can be a bit problematic. That's not something worth valorizing. 
right? If if your primary problem is pride and privilege, uh, then sort of humbling yourself in the image of this uh, humble Jesus might might be some moral progress for you. But if you've already been consigned to this place in society, um, that's not uplifting, right? That's not something to aspire to. That's not something um, as valuable about Jesus. And so you see a lot of black theologians sort of reconfiguring the significance of the incarnation, uh, thinking about it in terms of Jesus' power to confront authorities in the day, or Jesus' power to heal uh, the poor, or Jesus' a simple ability to feed large numbers of people, uh, and they find more value in these stories as, uh, as opposed to Jesus' humility or his, his, his suffering. There are a number of feminist theologians who find Jesus' substitutional sacrifice to be unjust. Um, they, they find the idea of God sacrificing a son to be abhorrent because they cannot conceptualize thinking that it's a good idea um, for a, a child uh, to be ordered to their death by a parent, uh, pr- drawing upon uh, you know a, a a more immediate and visceral relationship that women have through pregnancy with their children, it just it clashes too much with their experience. And so now we got to rethink some of the the significance of um, whatever work Jesus is doing in his death on the cross. So it's often something about the theology they've been fed does not jive with their experience. So back to the drawing board to find a way of thinking about Jesus or God or other stories in in the Bible that are going to work better for their community's aspirations. And I think that that raises an interesting point. A lot of communities that someone uh, who is used to being in a position of power um, might neglect a lot of their experiences, might not see what they see in the text, but it's going to be there. There are a Mm -hmm. number of different ways that the Bible speaks to the oppressed, the downtrodden, the marginalized. And that's obviously one of the blind spots in the majority theology is that it's not seeing things from that perspective, which means it is is woefully incomplete. It is not able to reach everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think one of the, uh, your dissertation uh, which you wrote for, as part of your uh, doctoral degree, was on uh, Ezra. And we have uh, the where Ezra is reading out the law to everybody, basically letting them know from here on out, here how things are going to be. Oh, and by the way, if you married women from these people groups or these identities, you have to divorce them and send them away, uh, <laughs> which is um, a remarkably ethnocentric uh, mm-hmm. kind of act that we generally like to gloss over when we talk about that in Sunday school. But um, yeah. <laughs> I wonder if you wouldn't well, mind. One could say that there are those out there who would love to not gloss over that yeah, and, yeah. and hold uh, <laughs> solidly to it, even in today's, uh, in, 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 in now. Yeah. Again, there's me defaulting to my own experience with <laughs> uh, a specific religious community. But uh, yeah. I wonder if you wouldn't mind talking about how you approached uh, the, the question of uh, interethnic marriage and what Ezra was doing in, in uh, structuring power. I think you were looking at Ezra 10, is that correct? Yeah, Ezra 10 is where the, it's called the intermarriage crisis is, is discussed. As, Ezra is in a very transformational and volatile time in, in, in ancient now Judea and not really Israelite anymore history. We're talking about post-exile now, the, mid of the middle of the 5th century BCE. He has the unenviable task of having to reconstitute the identity of his people in terms that make more sense to them. And, and, and that, is, that is primarily to th- rethink of themselves as a people whose primary touchstone experience is coming back from exile and resettling in Jerusalem. Prior to this, it had been the, the Exodus. The Exodus was the, the defining experience of ancient Israelite collective conscience and ethnicity. And now it's this other thing is coming back from another place. Um, and part of the way he does that is to draw these very firm, but at the same time indeterminate lines on the ground about who gets to marry who, what ethnicity is really going to count as w- this emerging Jewish ethnicity. We, we, we can at this point we can finally start to sort of use this word Jewish as opposed to 
um, Israelite? What's going to be this Judean ethnicity in this time period? And in order to accomplish that, he draws on what at that point several centuries old laws um, from from various legal material in the Pentateuch to say that the people groups that surround you today are similar enough to, although we know not in literal in literal fact cannot be identical to the groups that were existed back then a long time ago. And God said a long time ago, you cannot intermarry with them. So God is saying now, obviously, it must be the case that you cannot intermarry with these people as well. You have to get divorced. Uh, this is the only narrative description of divorce anywhere in the Hebrew Bible. It's it's uh, Divorce is very rarely spoken about. Uh, even in legal material, there are only a couple references to it here and there. And I don't think there are any other narrative examples of it. Uh, so it's here. And it's a mass divorce. And it's a mass divorce that's coerced. Right, Ezra, caught, Ezra has all the people in the entire region gather in the temple courtyard under pain of confiscation and exile from the community. And they are forced to go through this proceeding in order to determine which marriages are legitimate and which are not, and everyone who's found illegitimate uh, is compelled to get divorced. And, and in the end, uh, about a hundred families are broken up as a result of Ezra's decree. So it's a very dramatic moment in the Hebrew Bible. Again, like Dan said, we gloss over this a lot. It's not read hardly at all. Um, I have the Ancient Christian Commentary series that has a bunch of commentary from like the first seven centuries of the church. Nobody <laughs> except for um, Bede, uh, the venerable Bede, or whatever, however you say his name, he was the only person for like the first seven centuries of the church that comment on this. And even today, we don't continue to read this text. So it's 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 underread and uh, and not reflected on often. For the past. 70 years or so, biblical scholars and theologians have been trying to justify what Ezra did as we sort of become increasingly conscious of how bad this kind of ethnocentrism is. Scholars have put in a lot of work to try to vindicate Ezra's decision to force these people uh, to get divorced because it's, it's terrible, especially for the children involved who go off to fates unknown. We have no idea what happens to the children of these marriages or, or to the wives involved. Um, it, uh, they could be an immediate uh, threat of death, um, depending on the circumstances. So scholars have put a lot of time and energy into trying to say, you know, no, Ezra did the right thing, and they give various justifications for that. Is it generally agreed that this is historical? Yeah, I think so. Or, or at least that it, it reflects something that happened in sort of smaller measures periodically over the course of, of a long period of time. Okay. But I haven't seen a lot of attempts to challenge uh, outright the historicity um, of the event. It's sort of an embarrassing thing to admit to, um, and it keeps coming up. Some of these issues return again in Nehemiah, uh, which many scholars take to be a bit, a bit later. So um, it, it seems to be a recurring problem. It's not just a one-off sort of event. Uh, so what my dissertation did is try to find a different way to read it um, without valorizing Ezra, without finding the meaning of the passage in Ezra, and instead try to find some moral significance in what the gathered people do. Um, and there's this cultural anthropologist named James Scott who spent some time in Malaysia studying how peasant communities resist oppression in these very subtle sorts of ways. And so I took his work and I applied it to this passage and I said, look, the people in this scenario um, resist Ezra and his demand for divorce in some of those same ways. They, they, they foot drag, that is to say, they take a long time to do it. They sort of appropriate some aspects of the process. They demand to have their own native judges involved in the divorce proceedings. They do all these very subtle little things that are easy to gloss over. But the end result is that only 100 families get divorced, which is like less than 1% of the population of the community. And they're almost all priestly families. So it sort of backfired. The Second Temple community is like, you guys out there, you are an existential threat to our community. You're going to ruin the whole thing. God's going to destroy us all. If you out there in these rural vi rural villages don't shape up, and at the end at the end of it all, almost all the marriages of the rural villages are held intact, and, and it's just really the priests who are most on board with this ideology who end up sort of breaking apart their own families. And I attribute that to sort of the cleverness of the assembly. Wow. I know that there's a there's a long history of of re, well I don't know how long the history is but this resistance I think is um, has been discussed in a lot of scholarship I know I've been uh, I've worked in Bible translation for a while and there's an example mm. and I'm um, from a while ago about 
um, and now I'm going to forget the the language that it was, but there was a, oh, it's in Southern Africa, one of the Bantu languages. Um, I think there's a, um, the translation of the New Testament. Uh, it was initially, they used, for demons, uh, the translators decided to use this word that referred to ancestral deities from mm. the local community as a way to try to kind of influence the locals into thinking of these ancestral deities as wrong, as mm-hmm. demonic. And so to try to kind of push them away from, from continuing to appeal to these ancestral deities for guidance and for blessings and things like that. And it kind of had the opposite effect where they uh, appropriated that translation choice and began to um, re- appeal even more to these ancestral deities, and use the Bible as kind of an icon, as as a, a piece of cultic media in the um, uh, in the petitions, in the interactions with uh, these deities. And so they had to uh, the folks from Europe who uh, were colonizing this area had to come in and retranslate the Bible, so that's. Uh, they kind of cut out uh, that resistance from uh, underneath the the locals who were uh, had basically taken what they had done as an act of uh, kind of oppression and mm-hmm. subverted that. and uh, and I, I find it so fascinating when we see uh, examples of of that kind of thing. And I've never noticed that uh, in Ezra, but that is kind of they uh, they kind of shot themselves in the foot there and forced themselves to abandon some families uh just because they were yeah. they were the ones pushing it and i guess they had to go through with it if uh if they that's were right. the ones making the big deal about it uh, yeah that's exactly right it, it is and that's one of the reasons why i think contextual theology is so valuable these there, there's an entire energy for theology that can only be found amongst oppressed peoples that is that is such an inspiration for the doing of theology mm. you know Privileged, relaxed, comfortable people can do theology, certainly, but there's less of an impetus. To, there's less of a need to do it, I think. And so, when you put people, you know, in these really desperate situations, they become very theologically creative very quickly, and 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 you get to see the product of that creativity in these contextual theology. So, yeah, they will they will take translations, they will play with words, they will subvert expectations left and right, and they will do everything they can. In order to ensure the survival of their community, um, and and you get in touch with a little bit of that through this contextual theology. One of the things that I wonder about, uh, because it's very clear, because I loved the uh, the examples that you gave of how to use contextual theology uh, and how how people use uh, their context um, to to sort of reimagine the stories of the Bible. I wonder at what point are are there points at which it's not a useful uh exercise to look at it theologically and it just needs and there are, there are certain stories or certain ideas from the Bible that you just jettison altogether as opposed to looking for ways to recontextualize to make it okay or to or to find something good in it like at what point are you stretching beyond the bounds of where that book can actually take you? That's an interesting question. I, I, th- there's, I think there's like at least two questions there. One is, at what point do you stop trying to make it okay? And the second question is, at what point do you stop sort of working with it theologically? And I, th- I think the answer to that first part comes way before the second part. So I, I think when we stop making it okay is a point that we're going to reach first but just because it's no longer okay doesn't mean that you still can't work with it theologically. It can be used for other things um, as an indictment on the original author and audience. Um, so yeah, I, th- I think there are plenty of stories in the Bible that have no moral value or that I just outright don't think personally God had anything to do with. I mean, I'm, I'm a religious person. I, I, I think there's, there's just, there's no God here at all. Um, so you're thinking like the, the, gen- the genocide of the Midianites, uh, in numbers, I, just, I mean, this this is presented as a direct command from God. I, I don't think you can fix that. I don't think you can fancy theology your way out of that. Um, that doesn't mean that you don't say anything theologically about it, but it would instead be 
an example of religious extremism. Look how bad things can get. Look how twisted our imagination can get. Look at how malicious we can become when we are trying to uh, um, demonize these other communities, when we are trying to polemicize against other people. Look at how God can be employed in that in that harmful work. So it's not that we stop thinking about it, but yeah, you, there are plenty of places where you just go, that's, that has nothing to do with any God that I'm worshiping or thinking about or, or that's involved in any way in my, my life. And the, and the project of trying to um, accommodate those things theologically is going to be, is going to continue among those groups of folks who can't accept that God is not in those passages. And so I think yeah. we need to stay informed about them as well in order to be able to push mm-hmm. back against uh, attempts to rehabilitate things like the uh, the Midianite genocide. I, I did well, want- Who's that guy that wrote that book length review of Paul Copen's? Oh, Tom Stark. Yeah, it was like a yeah. 250 page review of yeah. the- Yeah, uh, so, <laughs> that's, a, so- that's exactly what- <laughs> So Copan's book was, Is God a Moral Monster? And Stark's response, which is freely available online, you can go find in a revised and updated edition. It's called, Is God a Moral Compromiser? Um, and I think it's a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful discussion of the problems with Copan's mm-hmm. attempt to rehabilitate the, this perspective about God, where these are uh, oppressed peoples who have, you know, they're under the boot of this empire and they're mm-hmm. the only way they can make themselves feel better is kind of fantasizing about being on the other side. Mm-hmm. And, you know, once you get out from under that boot, those fantasies should not be operationalized any further. There's, exactly. uh, and, and this is something we talked about with, uh, with Bart Ehrman is with revelation, people need to find themselves in revelation to make it relevant, which means mm-hmm. finding oppressors around us. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. For a lot of the folks who are most concerned about this, they, they are the ones in the position of the oppressor, and so they've got to to look for others who are um, who can be vilified. Uh, but I did want to share. I, I looked up real quick the language. It was the Setswana okay. Bible translation, the Wookie Bible, which is um, an old, very very classic translation. But the word for um, daimonios they rendered as badimo which is a word that refers to these ancestral spirits. And there's a paper by mm. Musa W. Dubé. Called, oh, yeah, Musa Dubé. Oh, okay, Dubé, excuse me. I, I know a Dubé, but it's Dubé there. Okay. Um, and uh, the paper is entitled Consuming a Colonial Cultural Bomb, Translating Badimo into Demons in the Setswana Bible from a uh, journal for the study of the New Testament back in 99. But that was a great discussion. <laughs> uh, of yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to to make sure. No, I, that, that's, I, that's that's good context. Yeah, that. uh, Musa Dube is a a great post colonial theologian. Uh, she does a lot of uh, a lot of great stuff, especially in that sort of African context. And there, and you bring up post colonialism, which is another framework that can be another. Um, yeah, post colonial theology. theology. Too. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask a bit about uh, your experience on TikTok and engaging in public scholarship. I know you kind of framed this as kind of forced upon us by uh, the uh, pandemic and being trapped inside. But yes. uh, <laughs> now that you have uh, become an advocate for uh, public scholarship, have you learned anything about engaging the public and trying to uh, help them uh, grapple with the Bible in a more productive, more informed way? Or have you just decided uh, none of this is going to work out in the end? <laughs> um, man, it depends on the day. Um, I, I definitely found, found it worthwhile. Um, I, I wouldn't continue to do it if it's not worthwhile because it is difficult. Uh, and and for me, at least, it can often be very time consuming. I, I don't know how long it takes you to make TikTok videos, but it, it takes me a long time to make even <laughs> really simple ones. Um so it it is it's time consuming and it's and it's emotionally intensive. I I I do get. I mean, people will write to me and they'll say, you know, I I never knew any of this before. This has been so liberating for me. This has been so helpful for me. Um, even up to like, you know, I'm I'm considering going back to the church or I'm considering Christianity for the first time in my life. And those things those things keep me going. You know, I that that. Even one or two of those every few months is enough fuel to keep me going through all the you know nonsense that I, I put up with on on a daily basis. So I, I definitely found it to be worthwhile. Um, 
it, it has been very interesting f- from a learning perspective. You, you really have to, it's not, it's not I, I think, simplify sort of undersell. You have to find something in whatever you're going to say that's immediately going to be desirable to somebody who otherwise doesn't know anything about this material. And trying to do that um, is, is difficult. Um, but you also sort of get to see a new side of the material that you're looking at. Like, what is the thing about all this in this 25-page article or in this 250-page book? What is the one thing that somebody completely outside the field is going to latch on to and valuable? And what I've learned is, one, there is all, almost always something there. And two, it takes a while to, to sort of boil it down to that. Yeah, um, And that's also been an optimistic thing for me. I mean, no matter how ivory tower this stuff can be, there's almost always something there that could really spark somebody to um, to, to rethink Bible or, or, or Christianity or whatever it is in, in a new way. So would you say that uh, all biblical scholars should take uh, take a few reps on on TikTok and kind of work <laughs> out that that muscle of learning to distill these complex discussions down to those as kind of the essence of it, but also in a way that is going to uh, be of some kind of interest to the general public? Do you, th- do you think that makes you a better Bible scholar, a better teacher in the classroom, uh, or do you think it just makes you a better TikToker? That's a good question. I, I definitely think more should. I don't know if all should, but but more should. And, and I, I think, think of some very, who should not. So. Yeah, I, <laughs> so some immediately come to mind for the no. Yeah. Um, but but others. I mean, it it is its own thing. So I I don't I wouldn't like shame a biblical scholar for their unwillingness to come on. It it is its own skill set. It is it is its own time and and uh, and sort of dedication to trying to figure out how to do. I definitely think more should. Uh, more importantly, I think. I don't know how you would change this, but I think it would be really helpful if the culture and the academy shifted in such a way that this work was just seen as more valuable. Like, oh, such and such is making content for over there. Oh, that's a great thing. You know, let's get excited about that. I, you I, could go to SBL and have a section on it. You know, yeah. you could do you could do a presentation. You know, this worked for me. This didn't work for me. I would love to see more enthusiasm in the academy in general, even if people don't participate in mass, just to have it be wider, more widely accepted. I, I think being able to see it as a part of the academy would be wonderful yeah. because you know it remains that ivory tower, and where you know pushing the ladders away from the building of the people who want in to want to see what's going on and say, no, mm-hmm. this isn't for you when we treat this as something that as a hobby that someone does on the side. And I think increasingly this is going to be the way that a lot of folks who are not able to get the tenure track positions and things yeah. like that are going to, um, one, see their uh, what they're producing be consumed, but two, if they have any hope to make any any money uh, continuing in something that they obviously have passion for, I think you're going to see a lot more people moving in, in that direction. So mm-hmm. I, and, and I think there are folks out there who are doing that, who are trying to to bring it into the mainstream. And, you know, 15 years ago, there was biblio blogging. I don't know if you ever uh, saw any of that or got into no, any of that. No, not really, no. There were a handful of, uh, of uh, biblio bloggers. So I was a part of that for a little bit where we just had blogs and, and tried to do what I think we're doing a little more successfully now on TikTok, but on blogs, which was not incredibly helpful. It was, again, just us talking to each other. But um uh-huh. Well, Aaron, I I I want to jump into this part of the conversation because I know that it's not all uh, you know, peaches and roses turning academic study of the Bible public facing. I mm-hmm. I'm guessing that especially since most people are used to hearing discussion of the Bible from their church, from the pulpit, and and yeah. they're not used to hearing it uh from I mean, in your case, a believer, but who still, uh, who nevertheless is going to bring some very challenging ideas uh, into this public space. Can you talk a little bit about pushback that you've gotten, or if 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 you've received any sort of uh, like, there must be a little bit, there must be some blowback to that. Yeah, there's a lot. There's f- fortunately, I, I guess I'm. I'm lucky that I haven't gotten I mean, the kind of pushback that would really bother me would be 
you know, <laughs> like an all right, let's see it. You got actually something wrong in your video. That, that would be the kind of, that would be the kind that I would be like, man, I really need to, you know, fix something here. That would be the kind that I would like really take to heart. And I don't get virtually any of that. Uh, I don't get like ABH Bible debunked, you know, thing. People don't interact with, maybe it's just because I'm not that, that well known, but I don't get a lot of that very straightforward kind of pushback. I get a lot of the angry TikTok atheists being like, where's your evidence for God's existence? I'm like, this is about source criticism, not about, you know, or something, or something. it's a completely unrelated topic. And I get a lot of angry fundamentalists who are like, you know, you're going to hell or, you know, they ask weird, like religious questions in the middle of your, you know, stuff. So that's mainly what I get. And at this point, I mean, that, that sort of weirded me out initially, but I'm like two years into this. So I, I, I usually either just play with them or, or, or ignore them. And it, and it's, it pretty much goes away. Um, that's been the vast majority of the pushback that I've gotten. Um, I, I do get, I don't know if it's pushback, but I do get encouraged to, you know, talk more about this or, you know, have you considered this? And sometimes people do ask me questions about personal faith things. And, and I am very, I, I dole that out in very small amounts. I, I, I don't, I'm not entirely hands off with it, but I am very, guarded about the kinds of things that I share and that I just don't, I don't like the conversations that's, that start once you start talking about personal faith issues, that there's no good way to have that conversation with semi-anonymous or anonymous strangers online. Um, it could, it could only be bad. And so, but I do occasionally sort of encourage slash remind my viewers that, you know, I, I am a Christian. I'm doing this from a Christian perspective. At the end of the day, I, I teach at a Christian school. I, I can't, say that I have a pastoral heart because I think that that's, that's more than I have. Um, but I, I am not unsensitive to or insensitive to the needs of, of lay people sitting in the pews. And as much as I can, I, I, I try to speak to that. So I have been encouraged slash gently given pushback on do more of that. And I try, I try to do that where I can. Um, but on the whole, it, it's a lot of, it's a lot of, it's a lot of nonsense that, that I've learned to ignore as far as pushback is concerned. <laughs> Would you say that your TikTok experience on the whole has been largely positive or, uh, or has it been, has the pushback been enough to make it a mishmash? No, the, the pushback ha hasn't really had an effect on it. I, I think overall it's been a net positive. Um, trying to build a follower base. I mean, the, the most difficult part is just like the logistics of it. Like, and it, it can be kind of demoralizing to, you know, like not have anything go viral and like not, you know, and, and still, and, and to have a very slow follower growth over time. Um, but that, that doesn't have anything really to do with uh, pushback or anything. That's just TikTok and, you know, whatever TikTok is doing behind the scenes with algorithms and stuff. Um, so that's when the, it, that's the real God is the, yeah. algorithm. <laughs> the yeah. Yeah. so whenever I get like depressed and like throw up my hands and I'm like, I'm never going to do this again. It's not because somebody said something mean. It's just like, is this still, am I reaching new people? Are, are, are new people being invited to the table? You know, is that's, that's the only thing that sort of gets me down. But, but on the whole, it's been a, it's been a positive experience, both, both for me. And I, I think for many of the people who have been uh, watching. Well, it's been a positive experience for me. I'm, you know, I, I'm an atheist and I'm out there, you know, I don't consume a lot of uh, biblical or religious themed content, but I really enjoy what you bring to the table. I think that uh, your perspective and your sort of gentle, but you ha you have this wonderful subversive thing where your 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 voice is so soothing and your your content you, you know your approach is gentle and kind, uh, and yet uh, you you don't shy away from very difficult topics and uh, and controversial topics. I find your content very uh, engaging, and I really appreciate it. Well, I'm I'm very glad to hear that. And he and he's not just saying that. When I when I messaged him and was like, "Hey, I think we should have Aaron Agashi on," he was like, "Oh, is he that guy? Yeah, well, that would be great." So, well, um, what Dan's not realizing is that earlier I said, "Hey, should we have this guy on?" And Dan was like, "Yeah, maybe sometime." And then like weeks later, he was like, "Let I'm I'm get, I'm working <laughs> yeah, to get yeah, Aaron on." Serious scholars, probably misrepresenting that. 
<laughs> yeah, you have to get the advisor on first so that you can, you know, you well, know, and pay homage to the to, to the people that formed you. You got to do that first, for sure. And and my favorite videos of yours are the um, subtly sarcastic ones, um, like when you're complimenting me, and I'm like, is he being sarcastic? I can't. Stop. <laughs> no, 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 that's no, not not nothing but compliments. I, I, I wouldn't. I mean, that's I, uh, earnestly. I, I would not be doing this at all. Had it not been for seeing the success of your channel, I mean, truly, I mean, the, it would be very easy for anybody who's interested in doing this to get on. And if your channel did not exist, to be like, there's just no appetite for this, right? There's there's no interest in this at all, and and so it is very helpful to see somebody do this seriously and have it been successful. Um, it's bad in the sense that then I go, well, it's my, it's my fault. That it's not successful, so I can't I can't blame the people out there anymore. Uh, but I mean, the the fact that the the fact that you have been able to do this means that there are people who have a genuine interest, and and that helps a lot. So I, no, I no no shade at all. Well, I I, I appreciate I that, and no one was more surprised about that than me. Um, <laughs> I remember when I when I got on when I reached a thousand followers, I did a book giveaway. But not just one book. I gave away five books. I was like, this is a big deal. <laughs> and I remember somebody saying, in no time, you'll have 100,000 followers. And I was like, you've lost it. Uh, that's, that would be bonkers to think about. And, um, and that, you know, it didn't happen overnight, but it happened a lot more quickly than I thought it would have. And, um, and nobody's more surprised about that than me. But uh, I, I, understand exactly what you're saying about the people messaging you, making it all worth it. I get messages every day from um, all ends of the spectrum of both love and hate. So yeah. um, I think you you always, I figure that if I'm getting hate from all sides, then I'm probably right in the sweet spot. I'm doing something <laughs> right. Um, and, yeah. and that does make it make it all worth it. Every now and then I'll find one that will be particularly touching and like share it with my wife or something like that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that does make it feel like I'm not just out here entertaining myself. Um, mm -hmm. I am doing that, but at the same time, it, it <laughs> seems like it is being helpful for other people. And if it is helpful for other scholars who want to break Absolutely. into this, uh, this kind of activity, then I will be here as long as I need to. Cause, um, that is even more, um, as meaningful as all the other stuff is, to be respected by colleagues for doing something that I'm really doing because I could not get into um, full time teaching uh, is is something that means an awful lot to me. So um, I'm glad to see you're here. I have no doubt that you're gonna um, that your success will uh, will multiply and increase exponentially uh, in the future uh, as long as you you keep with it. So speaking of this, Aaron Higashi, how can people find you? Uh, where are your channels? Where pe people now are desperate for your content? They're they're clamoring, <laughs> clamoring. I say. Oh, they, I, I hear don't, them. I don't know if we have the authority to say that is the effect of of coming to our podcast yet. <laughs> I'm clamoring. How do how do people find you? Um, you can find me on TikTok at abh bible. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at abh bible. You can find me on YouTube. Um, I, I, you can search ABH Bible and I will come up or the actual name of the channel is Bible of Color. Um, and uh, a lot of that is the same content, although I do hope to be producing some content, standalone content, a little bit longer form for YouTube uh, over the course of the summer after things settle, my, my kids get out of school and like <laughs> things settle down a little bit. I'm just, I'm, I'm still, I'm finishing up final grades for this last semester at school. So uh, still a little bit busy right now, but. Um, yeah. And then I don't know, I, I, I sort of have thinking about some future projects, but, um, well, we'll keep see. us up we'll to see. date and yeah. let, let us know when you have something new that you want to pitch and, and we'll have you yeah. back on. And, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, well, that's it for today's show. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to us, you can reach us at contact at uh, dataoverdogmapod.com or uh, if you'd like to become a patron of the show check out our Patreon page patreon.com slash dataoverdogma thanks everybody for joining us we'll talk to you again next week have a wonderful day